Welcome everyone. Um, before starting, I will remind you that we have um, this is an hybrid, hybrid lecture still. So you have questions, those following online, please use the, the different sections to ask uh, your questions and this will be done at the end of the session. So uh, it's a pleasure to continue the invited lectures of the Josep Carreras Leukemia Institute. And today uh, we have uh, Professor Laura Lechuga. She's a full professor at the Spanish National Research Council, CSIC, and she's the head of the Nanobiosensors and Bioanalytical Application Group at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, ECN2, here in Barcelona. Uh, Professor Lechuga is a world reference in the photonic biosensor area uh, for the point of care diagnostics. So it's something unusual today. So it, the, one of the reasons to inviting her is to have a different view, not always the same, not always CRISPR-Cas9, no? to have a different view of, 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 of biology and biomedicine overall. She has more than 300 publications. She's very active in transfer technology with eight families of patents. She has uh, founded two spin-off, and I think there is a third one coming on, she told me, and she has presented his, her work work in many, in many lectures. She has received very prestigious awards, um, among them the Spanish National Research Prize in 2020, uh, Rejama Premier Award in te New Technologies in 2020, Ada Byron Prize, and the Physics and Innovation Technology Prize from the Spanish Royal Society of Physics, and the BBA Foundations, the Bordino Research Award, uh, the Medal of the International Foundation of All of Palme, and, and many others. But the main reason that she's here is to talk about her science and what she is doing there. And the title of her talk is going to be Nanobiosensor Devices for the Early Diagnosis of Cancer. Laura. So good morning to everybody and thank you, Manel, um, for the invitation. Um, because, well, we, we know each other for a very long time and then we have been doing events and some collaborations, so it's very nice to have the chance uh, to visit your institute. In fact, uh, even if we are an ICN2, also in a very uh, pretty new facility in the campus of the, of the, UAB, of the University of Barcelona, I have visited this and then I say, oh my God, this is a very, very nice building, uh, so much better than our institute. So. You are very lucky working here. Okay, so my presentation of today, uh, I will try just to explain to you what we're doing in the area of nanobiosensor devices and how we can apply this for the early detection of diseases. Uh, so I would, will tell you just a little bit, don't worry about the technology, how we fabricate and how we have the idea how to fabricate all these devices. Well, I have even some of the devices here because I always like that you take a look of the devices that we are able to produce and then to use uh, for this monitoring. And then I will explain just how we can apply for the early diagnostic several diseases. And in the last part of my presentation, I will focus more um, in the cancer detection, how we apply uh, for different ways, how to try to make a very, er how to help, uh, because in the, in the early detection of cancer. So, well, probably, uh, let's see, it's working. Okay. So probably you remember, well, everybody remember, uh, two years ago when we started the pandemic, uh, if you remember when we already knew the sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, then the only way to detect who was infected or not was with a PCR. And if you remember also during the first month, months of the pandemic, we saw a very long lines of people to get a PCR. So PCR is something that can be done in two, three hours. But um, because we were in this lockdown, because everybody wanted to, to have a test, so the problem was that you have thousands of millions of people that have to be tested at the same time. So PCR is a, a very uh, excellent technique, but the main problem is a centralized technique. And we know also that, for example, in Europe, more than one million cancer cases were not diagnostic during the lockdown and during the pandemic. I mean, the hospital were completely collapsed. People were not, was not able to go to the, to the hospital or to see even the, your family doctor. And then more than one million people died just because they didn't get the diagnostic on time. 
and there is also other side effects, the problem of the pandemic, like uh, you know that in, the, in 2020, we had a historical record of death from diabetes, for hypertension, for suicides, I mean many other, and the same, people was not able to go for a very basic uh, diagnostic just because due to the problem with the pandemic. Okay, so this is mainly due because even if we have very excellent techniques, um, then the main problem is that everything is centralized, centralized in these clinical laboratories, in hospital, in, in, uh, in, in, um, in other buildings, but all these techniques are excellent. You can provide a very early detection of many diseases, but uh, all of them are time consuming. Normally they, they need a very high sample volume. Still, we need to go for a sample for the blood testing. Still, we need to take milliliter of our blood. It's amazing that there is so, I mean, this amazing technological development and still we need milliliter of blood to do a basic test. Um, then we need also trained personnel, laboratory installations, sometimes very bulky and also expensive uh, instrumentation, for example, uh, for, in the case of the colorectal cancer, you need to go for a colonoscopy. And I don't know if you know the price of a colonoscopy in our health system, in the, our public health system for person. Manel, do you know the price? What do you think? No? Any guess? Maria should know, but... Uh, 500, yes. 500 here in our public system. In the US, for example, it costs like $2,500. So it's something that we cannot do in a very often too. It's also an invasive technique. So this is the main problem, okay? We have excellent techniques, especially, well, especially here in, the, in our countries, in Europe. Uh, but it's not the case if you go to Africa or, or their underdeveloped uh, countries. Okay, so what we want to solve is this problem. And we want to offer what we call a point of care biosensor technology. That the idea is the following, that you can just make the analysis just using a drop, a drop of, your, uh, of a liquid sample. Imagine that you can use a drop of blood, a drop of urine, a drop of uh, saliva, or a tear, and then you have this very tiny uh, sample, and then you can deploy in a very small device, something similar even like this pointer, where you deploy your liquid sample, and then the machine, I mean the device, is able to make an instant analysis just in a few minutes without any sample pretreatment, without anything, and even you can use in the bedside by the patient. So this is the idea in our area, how we are able to produce point of care biosensor devices, very intelligent devices, where you can do the analysis with a tiny sample. But of course, you have to give the same performance, I mean, the same sensitivity, the same specificity that you can get in an analytical laboratory. Probably you are aware of the, the first uh, wearable biosensor, this is a glucose biosensor, I think. Probably you have seen some people wearing this biosensor this, uh, in, the, in the swimming pool on the beach, I guess. Have you seen that? And the, the diabetic people wearing that. So this is the first wearable biosensor. This is an implantable biosensor. I mean, this is standard for 14 days. They have some micro needles. They go to the interstitial fluid, take the fluid, and they make the analysis in the interior of the biosensor. So the diabetic person just go with a reader, just pass by the by this. Um, were able biosensor and they can see in an instant way what is the concentration of their glucose. Okay, so this is the just was released by the Abbott company just a few years uh, before just the pandemic. So this is the idea. Biosensor are these devices that are able to provide to create this point of care devices that you contain all the functionalities of a complete analytical laboratory. So the idea is not only that you make a very easy diagnostic at the case of the glucose, but also with a very high sensitivity in a very fast way, and also in a very reliable and quantitative. This is also important because uh, we have some of the biosensor can say to you only yes or no, but it's but we know, like for example, in the case of cancer, this is also important to know the quantity. What is the quantity of the biomarker we are looking for in a sample? And then, of course, I mean, we would like to have also these multiplex capabilities that in one a single sample, you are able to detect many biomarkers at the same time. And also that can be user-friendly, minimum operations so that everybody just can push the button and put the sample, push the button and get the signal. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the area where we're working. And just to, to remember to you what is a biosensor, because I know everybody thinks biosensor is a, a sensor monitoring biomolecules, yes? This is what um, everybody thinks, and it's not. This is not the definition of a biosensor. In a biosensor, what we have is a biological receptor layer completely selective 
to the analyte, to the molecule that you want to detect in a very complex sample. And then uh, this is in contact with a transducer, with a sensor, in such a way that when the biomolecular interaction takes place, I mean, the biological receptor recognize the substance in the sample, there is a physical chemical chain in the interface that can be detected by the sensor in, in as an instant diagnostic. And then the, we can detect with a very high sensitivity just due to this, uh, I mean, the way that we integrate the, the, the devices, bio and sensor, I mean, the biological part and the sensing part, the physics part, all together. And that's the reason why we can get a very high sensitivity with a very specific and selective biomolecular recognition Real time, this is important. We don't need any fluorescent label. We don't need any amplification. This is real time in a very fast seconds or minutes. You have your signal. And then you can detect any substance. I mean, whatever you want to detect. Just providing that you have your biological receptor. This is the, the key. We can fabricate many sensors, but we need always the biological receptor. So you have to think, I want to detect this, this antigen, or I want to detect this microRNA, or whatever. We need to have the complementary biological receptor. Probably the most famous biosensor in the world is the glucose biosensor. Uh, this is a biosensor that 500 millions of people use every day, every day in the world probably the most famous one as you know and i don't know if there is any diabetic person in the in the, the audience but if you know the glucose biosensor you just uh, allocate one drop of your fingerprint and blood um, and then you get the analysis in five seconds in five seconds you know which one is the concentration that you have of glucose and the reason is because inside there is a biosensor where you have an electrode and where you have uh, the protein, the, uh, the, the corresponding enzyme, the glucose oxidase enzyme. That's the reason why this biosensor detects only glucose, even if in blood we have many other components. But in the interior of this very tiny uh, electrode, we have this glucose oxidase, and then that is the enzyme that catalyzes the, the, composi the composition reaction of the glucose. Okay? So the electrode just count the many electrons are involved in this redox process and they make a calculation what is the concentration of the glucose in that sample. Okay, there is also more, uh, um, uh, more uh, simple biosensor like the pregnancy test. I guess everybody has used the pregnancy test. I'm not going to use how many times, okay? <laughs> and of course, um, uh, and we have, uh, and all of us, we have been using all these COVID-19 tests. I mean, the antigen tests and the serological tests. All of these are more or less like a kind of a very simple biosensor because here, as you know, we, you have immobilized the corresponding or antibodies or antigens, and then you can detect also in a very tiny sample. Um, but this is a very sim uh, it's a simple biosensor because uh, here this, this, they give you only yes or no. Um, for us, it's important always to quantify, as for example, in the case of the glucose. I mean, glucose, we always have glucose. What is different is the concentration that you have in your blood in any time, in any moment. Okay, so, but to remember also that when we make biosensor, it's not only to think about how is the sensor, how is the biological receptor that you allocate, we have to do a complete engineering. So what we do in our lab is not only to develop the biosensor itself, I mean, the, what is the sensor, what is the biological receptor that you put on, to on top, you have to do a complete engineering. I mean that uh, you have to deploy a liquid sample, so you have to know how to deploy this sample, and normally we need to have some microfluidic uh, in cartridge integrated, for example, in our case that we use optical sensor, we need to alloc in include, for example, laser or LED. We have to also allocate some photo detector, electronics uh, to make all the data processing, uh, something uh, portable. You need to allocate also a battery charge. You have to allocate also a wireless uh, module inside. So I mean, that is a, an area where we make not, not only basic science, how you develop the sensor and the bioreceptor, but also the complete engineering and the complete technology in order to be able to deploy and to use this as we do, for example, in hospital or just to travel, I mean, or to move the biosensor, the point of care biosensor, whatever you want. Okay, uh, so this is more complicated because even if you are able to produce the biosensor, uh, normally at the laboratory level, well, normally everything is working, <laughs> but, uh, but in the case of the, in our, in our particular area, the World Health Organization has set uh, many, uh, just a, a list of criteria that we have to accomplish, which made our life even more difficult because mean that we have to make, well, 
all this. I mean, this is really, and sometimes it's really complex to try to accomplish all this at the same time to be affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, equipment-free, rapid, robust, well. And then you can use in anywhere, at any time, in any place. So this is the, the idea in our area. And also just to give you some number, how it's moving this market, because especially after the pandemic, before the pandemic, I mean, the area was um, in a very good development, but after the pandemic, now it's very, very clear that we need to decentralize the diagnostic. We have to use the diagnostic in everywhere at any time where we need. And that's the reason why the market is growing a lot. Yeah, in the, for example, in, in the last year, 20, uh, 2021, we have more than 25 billions of the market and the growth is more uh, around 8% every year. So, okay, but how we can use uh, that? Okay, so, I mean, there are many different technologies where you can uh, probably, you have listened sometimes about these technologies. So most of the people are using electrochemical biosensor because it's the, the technology behind the glucose biosensor. As I say, this is one of the most employed biosensor in the world, and there are many other biosensors just following, or point of care following this technology. There is a new technology, I don't know if you have here this, that is a very, very low cost one that is using paper. Someone just had this brilliant idea, why not to use the, what is the most, a very low cost material, okay, paper. So we can use the paper or the cellulose just to embed in the cellulose some nanoparticles, it's functionalized with the bio, biological receptor that you want. And then with this, you just, for example, in that case, this is a biosensor for a very, very low cost test of the HIV. And then you just put some drops of the urine of the, of the person, they just go by capillary forces and make a, this reaction. And this is a color test that you, even you can read with your iPhone, with your smartphone, and then you can see who is infected or not, uh, just by a very low cost test. There are many biosensors using nanoparticle, nanomaterial, and of course there is all this biosensor using this lateral flow, like the COVID test, all this uh, that we have been using. But I said this is a very simple one because it gives you only yes or no. In our case, uh, we use this, uh, what we fabricate in my, in my group, is uh, uh, chips, I mean biosensor working with light. Okay, so this is one of the biosensors that we developed. So we have many, some of them here, so my, my colleagues will show you around. You can see here, for example, this one, this is one that we are using in the lab. Look, look at this, this is just in comparison with the, the coin of one euro. And we have six biosensors in parallel here. So it's amazing the size that we can achieve. And then all the other is the, the optical circuit. In this one, we have 20 biosensors in parallel. Here we have four biosensors in parallel. So this is what we're producing in our group. So we produce the biosensor, and then we produce also all the engineering and how we develop. A very basic, don't worry that I'm not going to explain too much about physics, but just to, to, to let you know how the, the device is working. Imagine an optical fiber where you have the light that is traveling in the core of the fiber. If you look at the nanoscale, how the light is traveling, so let's see if it's, okay, the video is working. Ah, I don't know what happened. Okay, with the video. Not working well. The light is traveling um, just in our device. And the light, when you look, at, for example, in an optical fiber, the light is not always strictly confined in the interior. There is always some light that, uh, at the, that is coming at the nanoscale. So this light is uh, going like 100, 900 nanometer outside the surface of our sensor. And this light is interacting with the biomolecules. Remember that a biomolecule, for example, a, a, an antibody is standing only 10 nanometers, so, and the DNA is just a few nanometers. So mean that all the light that is traveling there, just see how many molecules are on top of our uh, sensing device. And what we do is the following. So we just monitor um, the refracted index chain at the sensor surface, so means also the molecular weight of the molecules that are there, because the light is traveling, and when the molecules arrive, the light that is traveling, see or there is some different material and the velocity of the light chain. So we can monitor at the end how much the velocity of the light has changed and then we can know how many molecules have been recognized on the sensor surface. 
So what we do in my group is just to develop all this technology. We have two branches of different technologies, nanoplasmonic biosensor using gold technology. All of them use it this principle, the light is traveling on the surface and interacting with the biomolecules. Uh, perhaps you have also used this technology. There is a f one of the most famous commercial device that is called Biacor. I don't know if you have used in Biacor. Biacor is using this principle. I mean, they use how the light is traveling in the gold at the nanoscale and how it's interacting with the biomolecules. Because this is an event in real time, we can monitor in real time how the molecules are interacting. So with our biosensor in the lab, we can, for example, immobilize an antibody, we flow the antigen and we see in real time when the, bio, the immunoreaction takes place. And also we have a single DNA strand, you flow the complementary, you see in real time how the hybridization is taking place on top of the sensor surface. Okay, so these are just some of the sensors that not going more in detail, but just to know that with the plasmonic, we can go for limit of detection between nanomolar, picomolar. Remember, this is label free. Uh, this is real time, no amplification of the signal. And in the case of this more fancy technology, silicon photonics technology, we can go for picomolar, fentomolar detection in real time and no amplification. And just to mention that uh, we do everything is done here in Barcelona. So we made a complete uh, design, fabrication, assembly, uh, and we produce all these miniaturized and compact, compact platform that we can go even to the hospital or to any place to do the measurements. And we have also this protected with, uh, with our IP. Okay, just uh, one slide more, how it's working. For example, how we use for the detection of the COVID-19 virus. So we are using, uh, we just immobilize some specific nanobodies on the surface and then when they, we put the sample with some virus and then when the virus is at, recognized by the spike of protein uh, of the virus, then the, the, there is a chain in the light and then we can monitor how, not only that we have uh, the person is infected, yes or not, that also from here we know how, um, we know the viral load. We have a quantification, we, we can detect even if a person has less than 100 virus per milliliter. So this is a very low limit of detection. Okay, you have uh, here a more close look, how it looks like. We fabricate this in the clean room facilities. We take, this is one of the chip. In the chip there is 20 biosensor and each of them has uh, just um, uh, a width of only three microns and they have a height of one to three nanometer. Well, you have to believe me because I mean, you cannot see this by eye, but the height of the, all these devices are only three nanometers. Okay, so the next step, and for, in my opinion, the most difficult one is because, okay, you have the chip, you have the sensor, but the most difficult step is the surface biofunctionalization. So you have to introduce your bioreceptor and we have to provide that uh, you have to maintain the structure and the functional properties. So we have to know uh, how to make this, for example, like just a chemical bonding on the surface. For example, you're using antibodies. We know that the antibodies, we need to, uh, to immobilize in the, in the, in the FE, FE fragment because we have to have give free to the fat fragment for the recognition of the antigen. In the case of the DNA, we have to have the straight on on the surface. So we have to, I mean, to play with many parameters in order to have this functionalization. But also the most uh, one we have probably also the most difficult for us is also the prevention of the non-specific interactions because we want to measure in real sample. Remember, real sample, no pretreatment, no cleaning if possible. So it means that we are going to have many, many non-specific interactions. So what we do is the following. We normally, we develop different strat chemical strategies, how to immobilize, for example, in this case is the protein. But one, we know how, we also calculate the density because many people think, okay, we are going to allocate many bioreceptors together, we are going to have better signal, and that's not true, because if, when you have a pack uh, monolayer, then there is the, uh, the analyte, you know, and the complementary molecule cannot enter due to aesthetic hindrance, so you, even we have to calculate the density, so we have to know where we have to allocate our bioreceptor, and also we have to block also the empty spaces, because we want just uh, to, to, I mean, to monitor real sample without crude sample, without minimum, uh, it's possible, minimum treatment, minimum dilution, 
and that's the reason why we have to add many additives, many blocking agents, for example, like hydrophilic blocking agents, and polyethylene glycol, and many de derivatives in order to avoid the non-specific interaction. Just an example, if we want to measure something in serum, what we do is just to make this uh, uh, immobilization of the, in the protein of the antibody in that case, and we try different uh, uh, different blocking agents, and for example, we found that this combination where we are using just a polylysine graft MP, a polyethylene glycol with a combination with, um, with this buffer that we can reduce more than almost 90% the non-specific interaction. So this is one of the most difficult steps in the biosensing because you have to produce the sensor, you have to allocate your bioreceptor, but then you have to know how to use the, the biosensor with real sample. Okay, once we have that, then we can go now for the, for, the real, for the real life and go to the clinical diagnosis. And then I want to show you a few samples before going to the cancer detection. For example, we developed a complete point of care platform for the active tuberculosis detection. So our idea was, okay, we want just to detect um, just uh, this, um, the lamb. Lamb is a lipopolysaccharide that is in the microbacteria uh, third wall. Uh, this is only present in person with active tuberculosis. It's the only biomarker for tuberculosis approved by the World Health Organization. Okay, and then we were just working with a proprietary uh, monoclonal antibodies able to detect the lab in urine. So what we wanted is to develop a, a technology where you can just measure the urine of the people and then to know who is infected or not in a matter of a few minutes. And then we did that. And then we were able to develop in this, uh, in this chip, we, we have six um, biosensors in parallel, this is the microfluidics. I think this is one of the, that is circulating that you have seen already. And then what we did was the following. With this, uh, we took 20 samples at the beginning, we didn't know who was uh, infected or not, uh, 20 samples from Tanzania. You can see the different color, different density. And we just uh, inject this sample without pre-cleaning, without diluting. And then our biosensor was able to discriminate who was with uh, active tuberculosis and who was a, a healthy person. Uh, so with a sensitivity and a specificity close to 100%. And also we, we need to use only 150 microliters. So this is a very, very small volume. And then no pretreatment in 10 minutes. So this is one example how is working our technology in the real life. Another thing that we are working a lot is in the uh, diagnosis of infections. As you know, infection is one of the uh, main problem now, nowadays, uh, especially for bacteria infection. And for example, this is one of the point of care biosensors that we developed. It was in a microarray format. And then, uh, for example, here we were just detecting the presence of the E. coli bacteria. Uh, with this biosensor, with this optical reading, we were able to detect even the concentration of bacteria, less than four bacteria per milliliter. So this is a very, very low quantity. But even then we went to the, to the Valdebron Hospital, to the intensive care unit, and then to, we would take sample from the patients and then to, from there, and we were able, without no problem, using 10 microliter of plasma in, in this case, 10 microliters. We were able to stratify without any problem who is a healthy person who has a systematic infl inflammation and he was entering in sepsis. So normally for them, they have to send the sample to their centralized laboratory and sometimes they, they take several days, even one day to get the answer. In our case, uh, we were able to have, I mean, to, to have all the, all the analysis done in 40 minutes, uh, one step on-site quantification. So this is also that we can also quantify the level of infection that has each person. Okay, and just the last example before going to cancer is our work in the COVID-19. So in the case of the COVID-19, we have been able to, uh, to develop all this for the biosensor for the virus detection. We're targeting the whole virus. It's something different. Everybody is targeting only the antigens. So they just break the virus and, and look at the, at the free antigens the, and the spike and the M protein. But in our case, we just were targeting the whole virus. And then we, I mean, with some um, collaborators from CMB in Madrid, they develop a specific nanobodies for each of the spike protein. We immobilized in our biosensor, and then we just flow the, the virus, and we were able to detect the viral load from 100 to 10 to 7 
a virus per milliliter. So we have an extended dynamic range. And this is something that was really claimed by the medical doctor during, during the pandemic, that they wanted to know what is the viral load of each person in each moment. Because if you are giving a treatment to a person in, for example, in the intensive care unit, you really want to monitor if the viral load is uh, decreasing or not that you are right in the, in the treatment. Okay, and we develop in 15 minutes, um, was, uh, we have the, the result. And, in the, and we develop also another biosensor for the serological detection for the level of immunoglobulins. And also we can have a biosensor where we give only yes or not, who was, I mean, he already developed the immunoglobulins, but also we give the quantitative number. Also in 15 minutes with a very excellent sensitivity, we were analyzing 100 of sample from Valdebron and Clinic Hospital here in Barcelona. And we have uh, the clinical validation has been done, and then now we have initiated also the technological transfer. So this is a very, I mean, it's a point of care, uh, similar to the serological test, but it, what we offer in addition is the quantification. So this is something, a, a very, very valuable um, data for many of the medical doctors. Okay, what we have done in the, how we can apply all this fantastic technology in the early cancer diagnosis. Okay, well, all of you, you are more expert than me in this area, and you know that the cancer is one of these major global health problem. I think in, in 2020, there was like 18 million of cancer cases, uh, more than nine from were in men and 8.8 in women. And we know that one in five people will develop cancer during our uh, lifetime. And prevention probably is the one of the most significant uh, public health challenge. Um, so uh, what we have to work is uh, what we need really in this area, and you know better than me, is not only therapeutic tool, but also diagnostic. I mean, to have a very, very early diagnostic. And this is the only way to improve the survival rate. So uh, what, we, of course, cancer normally is done, the detection is done with specific biomarkers. But in our case, we wanted to develop a point of care biosensor for this early cancer diagnosis. And the idea that we can focus in different kind of biomarker, genetics, epigenetics, and proteins. And the idea is that our biosensor can give a very fast time to result uh, with a minimum sample, again, label free and no amplification of the signal. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first example, how we do it, um, an early di diagnosis of colorectal cancer. And for that, we were at, um, making the analysis of the autoantibodies in serum. So the, as you know, the, in the case of the colorectal cancer, I mean, the clinical diagnostic technique is mainly, I mean, there is this uh, fecal, uh, the blood test, the fecal occult blood test, but it's not so specific. And then normally you have to go for a colonoscopy, which is a very highly invasive technique. And normally the, the colorectal cancer normally is detected in a very advanced stage. But we know that in the case of this, uh, this cancer, uh, in the, when we are starting the first cancer cells, these cancer cells segregate uh, what we call a tumor-associated antigens. And they have this immunological reaction and then they, they just segregate and they are um, just flowing in our blood these tumor-associated antigens. As a consequence of that, our immunological, uh, uh, immuno there is an immunological reaction and then our body starts to produce a specific autoantibodies to against this tumor-associated antigen. It looks like uh, these specific autoantibodies start to circulate immediately after the tumor, uh, the tumor appearance. And also, so this uh, that produced before the adenoma formation and increase with the tumor progression. So means that if we are able to detect that someone has these specific autoantibodies in their blood, means also that we can detect the cancer in a very early stage. Okay, there are several of these uh, tumor associate antigen that has been described, and then we just focus in four of them. And what we wanted to do, I still not finalized, but we wanted to do some multiplex detection, at least of four of them, to have a more precise diagnostic. And our idea was the following, to use our biosensor in such a way that we can detect, in that case, the tumor associate um, uh, and antigens, and then what we detect is the, uh, um, the autoantibodies in the serum of the pathogen. Okay, so this was our idea, and then we have been detecting and this uh, for several of these uh, tumor-associated antigens. You can see here, uh, of course, uh, this is well in PBS uh, standard buffer, but then we can go for serum and plasma. We need just to make a, a, just some dilution in that case in order to get a very high level of sensitivity, and our biosensor can detect in a direct way the presence of these autoantibodies in just in a few nanograms per milliliters. 
Uh, so we have done this for several of the antibodies. And then th that this is a demonstration that we can do this direct quantification or in serum or in plasma. Um, so we have access to a very few clinical sample at this moment. And then with this, we, we, we already were able to check that our, our biosensor was working well. Still, we need to do a much more extended clinical validation. But what we have demonstrated is that we can detect in the serum or in the, in the plasma of the people uh, in a very direct and level-free way the presence of these tumor-associated antibody, autoantibodies with a very good sensitivity, with a very good selectivity, with a very good reproducibility. And also uh, that uh, we can do that. We have a quantitative qualitative validation at this moment because we don't have a very standard clinical uh, data. But we think that in the future, when we, we are able to finish this biosensor, we can have a very easy point of care biosensor and probably even we can avoid colonoscopy. It's not only that we can detect in a very early stage, but also that we, can, we, we could avoid the colonoscopy in the future. Okay, so the, the, but of, of course, in the case of the colorectal cancer, we are just looking more at the protein biomarkers, and we were thinking there is another way, uh, I mean, to make a very early detection of cancer, and we came with an idea many years ago. It was um, how to, I mean, how to incorporate the epigenetics biomarker for this cancer diagnosis. As you know, in the case of the cell regulation pathway, I mean, when there is, uh, when we are starting a kind of, um, and different diseases, including cancer, we can also monitor that there is the few cancer cells, the first cancer cells start to deregulate this pathway. And there is, for example, a change in the epigenetic smart, like for example, the DNA methylation, will be also a change in the, in the alternative splicing of the isoforms from the messenger RNA producing different proteins. And then could be also a different, uh, uh, um, a different, form, uh, different levels of non-coding RNA, RNA regulation, like for example, micro RNAs. And most of them are also released in our blood or in other body fluids. And then our idea was, okay, there is an epigenetic regulation of the gene expression. This is a reversible process, so we can monitor and we, we can, to give the treatment of a person, this process can be reversible. So uh, all these alterations are related with cancer. Can we do a biosensor where we can monitor all of this at the same time? And then mm, we can have even a personalized um, a detection, a personalized diagnosis, and contribution contributing to the personalized medicine because we can have a more efficient and a more effective uh, way to detect the cancer and to follow up the treatment for each person. So it was our idea, why not to try to uh, detect the DNA methylation, the alternative splicing, and the microRNAs just with a biosensor means that uh, with a minimum sample, a manipulation in a very fast and sensitive way in a very easy analysis. I know that you can, uh, I mean, you can detect all these events in your labs, but of course you need a lot of time, you need also expensive instrumentation, and our idea was to simplify, I mean, to be able to demonstrate that you can do this with a biosensor in a very fast and simple way. Okay, so we started uh, uh, looking at the microRNA, and in this case we were using the expression of the microRNA in the, for the early detection of the bladder cancer. As you know, microRNA, this is a very short non coding RNAs, normally between 18, 20 nucleotides, and they act as a post-transcriptional regulator in the gene expression. And the microRNA are um, influencing many processes at the cell level, but they are implicated in many diseases, for example, in diabetes, in other neurodegenerative disorder, but also in cancer. And they are a very promising biomarker because uh, this is, um, um, they are just pressing in, in many biofluids. They are pressing in, in blood, they are pressing in urine, uh, in saliva, so it will be a very, very easy target for, for making a very early detection. But of course, there are problems because normally they are in a very low concentration in these biofluids. Sometimes they are in the picomolar, in the nanomolar, femtomolar range, so this is a very low concentration. And also sometimes the difficulty you want to detect one specific one could be similar homologous that they have a different only one base. So this is also very difficult because we are targeting only one and not the others. Okay, so we wanted to show how we can use the biosensor uh, to determine the blood cancer stage in urine. And we use as a biomarker the microRNA1A1A. 
and this is the different, the very similar microRNAs from the same family, and we have to detect only this one. So what we did is just to make a, um, a proper chemistry, and then we would we mobilize the complementary DNA strand, complementary to the microRNA 1A, 1A. Uh, we always include in our, in our, uh, in our biosensor um, a vertical space, um, a tail of, uh, uh, 15 timines in order, I mean, to have that the DNA probe has more flexibility and then they can hybridize without any problem. And then with this, we demonstrated, this is in buffer, we just flow the complementary, we have the sensor with the microfluidic, we just inject the, the, the complementary. And then we can detect this, the presence of this microRNA in the femtomolar regime. And in fact, we were able even to detect uh, with an ultra low uh, limit of detection of only 20 atomolar. Remember, this is a direct detection. We are just having the probe on the surface and then we flow the complementary. Uh, so we have also, it's not only important the limit of detection, it's also the dynamic range because we have to cover a, a, as wide as possible dynamic range. So we just can evaluate the concentration for 10 atomolar to 10 picomolar. And also, you, um, and also we can see here the real signal from the sensor, from the different concentration, but also uh, we prepare our sensor surface in such a way that you can detect this microRNA and not the similar one. So even if there is a one base mismatch in the microRNA, we can detect only the one that we are targeting just because how we prepare our sensor biosurface. Okay, and then what we did was we have access to a few samples of uh, patients and then we were able to stratify because what we saw was a significant overexpression of this microRNA uh, in the cancer patients as compared to the healthy, healthy control. So in the future could be also a good way to just few drops of urine put on the biosensor and we know who can even starting a, a, a blade cancer process. Okay, and then the, our, the, the last example I want to show is the lung cancer detection. As you know, lung cancer is one of the highest incidence and mortality rates cancer. It's very difficult to detect in the very early stage, and the number of deaths is, uh, is even higher than the brain, prostate, and colorectal and breast cancer together. Uh, so it has a very pure, uh, pure prognosis on the five-year survival rate of less than uh, 20%. Uh, and the main problem, as I say, is always the, I mean, when the diagnosis is done, is normally in a very advanced stage. And again, the clinical diagnosis is mainly with all this medical exploration, um, uh, with biopsies, with um, biomolecular tests, imaging, and so on. And we wanted to provide here is this biosensor for the early detection of, um, of um, lung cancer. And we're focusing again in microRNA, in DNA methylation, and protein biomarkers. And again, as we did in the, in the case of the um, before, so with, in the case of the lung cancer, we're focusing in three microRNAs, the three that are described as the uh, predominant one as a biomarker. And then I can show you here the sample that how we detect the microRNA 215P. Again, what we mobilize is in our surfaces, the DNA probe complementary to the second of this microRNA, when we produce a complementary hybridization. So what you look here are the real signals. So this is the hybridization taking place on top of the sensor surface in real time. And we can detect until a limit of detection, in this case, of 381 picomolar. So we have also a very huge um, dynamic range for the measurement that we can detect in a very low concentration. Okay, uh, so uh, we also demonstrated that we were doing this measurement in blood plasma uh, with undiluted blood plasma. This is also important to notice. And then in that case, we were assessed to at least to 40 clinical samples from people having lung cancer. And then we are using a volume of only 100 microliters of this uh, plasma. And then with our um, um, biosensor, we were able to discriminate. We have a very good statistical difference between the healthy and the people with lung cancer. Um, and we have 20 samples from people having cancer and 20 uh, healthy people. And we also validate the results with the PCR. And then we have, we can see also that we have a very good um, uh, statistical discrimination between the patients uh, and the healthy uh, controls uh, and also very good correlation with the result from PCR. 
uh, the sensitivity and the specificity is the around 80%, but it's enough to do all this measurement. And uh, we think that we have a very acceptable diagnostic capability uh, in that case for this microRNA. Remember that we want to detect this, uh, all the events at the same time, so we can detect also all the other microRNAs. And also what we want to do is to detect the DNA methylation. So this is also this epigenetics biomarker. As you know also, in the case of the DNA uh, methylation, it means that it's the addition of methyl groups in the five position of the cytosine, and it affects mainly the CPGS Iceland. And this is, uh, I mean, uh, it's a very, well, I think you, you are more expert than me in this institute about this, uh, uh, using the DNA methylation as a bi specific biomarker for cancer because the cancer has a unique methylome. But of course, when you want to detect the, the level of methylation of your DNA, uh, you need to use all these biomolecular techniques. You need to use mainly bisulfite um, conversion. You have to use uh, enzymes, uh, rest restriction enzyme, and then you have to go to this immunoprecipitation sheet to do the measurements. And we want to provide a technique where you can avoid all this. No bisulfite, no enzyme, and real-time detection. How we did that? So our approach was the following. Because we want to detect the double, DNA that has, that has all the methylation sites, okay? So the, our challenge is we have to detect double standard DNA. We have to differentiate between the methylate versus the non-methylate. Uh, what we did was the direct detection and quantification of this DNA fragment. And what we do was what we call a triplex approach. So in that case, what we're using is a double strand DNA uh, as a capture probe. And then we are using in that, I mean, sorry, the double strand uh, that DNA is captured by uh, this PPRH prof. These are polypurine reverse hyperine. They are two antiparallel sequences complementary to the target sequence, uh, to the target gene. And this is prepared by the group of Ramon Ericha here in Barcelona. And then we were also collaborating with Manel uh, several years ago to demonstrate that this technology can really work. And then we can detect one, the first step is, okay, we capture the double strand, the methylated double strand, first step. And the second step, we introduce an antibody who is completely specific uh, to the cytosine uh, places. And then we can even uh, know the quantity, I mean, the amount of, um, of, met of methylation, sorry, the methyl places, the methyl uh, allocation in the, in the strand. Okay, so two steps, capture of the double a strand DNA, and then we introduce this antibody, this anti-5-methyl cytosine antibody, and then we make the quantification of the number of methylated uh, Iceland. Okay, so advantages, don't use uh, bisulfide, don't use amplification, we don't use enzyme. Okay, and this is a demonstration. In the case of the lung cancer, we are looking at four uh, genes, the more representative one. Here we have the sample with the CDO1. Uh, CDO1, um, and, and then as you can see here, first we did the capture of the double strand DNA, and then we introduced here uh, the antibody, and then you can see the different signal depending on the number of methylation that we have in the in the in the DNA strand. So uh, we have a very very good discrimination between the DNA methylation level. We have zero to six uh, methylation islands. So. And this is a demonstration that we can do, as you see, real-time no amplification and a very simple uh, test. Uh, we have been doing even that in blood plasma. Um, we have also, at, as well, we have a very good discrimination level with a different level of um, methylation. So this is a demonstration that our technology um, is really suitable to do this analysis without, I mean, going to the labor at your biological analytical laboratory and then to do a very, very extended um, uh, um, um, as assays in the, in the laboratory. Okay, still we are waiting for uh, have a clinical validation. We have always the same problem. I mean, sometimes uh, getting the, uh, the clinical sample is sometimes a nightmare for us, especially when they are so difficult like this. I mean, it's not so easy to get um, uh, this sample from cancer patients. And also because we wanted, for example, even to use, to know, I mean, to have sample from the different stage of the cancer, and this is also quite uh, quite complex, so we try, so if any of you can collaborate, so I will be very happy because we always have problem, problem of the access to this uh, clinical sample in the case of the cancer. And just, uh, we have been also 
monitoring microRNA, DNA methylation level, and then we are also incorporating protein biomarker. In the case of the lung cancer, we are looking at the neuron-specific analyzed protein. This is one of the uh, well biomarker already uh, highlighted as one of the promising biomarker for the for the lung cancer with a predictive and prognosis value. And in theory, you can discriminate the cancer type and the stage. The clinical values normally found in the patent is around uh, 11 nanogram per milliliter. And what we have been doing as well is just to demonstrate uh, how the, the real signal from the lab, and this is the calibration curve. So with our biosensor, we just immobilize the, the specific antibody and then against the NSA protein, um, and then with, with a direct covalent detection, and then we can have a limit of detection around 200, uh, two, sorry, two nanogram per milliliter already in 25% diluted plasma because we are very, uh, I mean, we are really well suited to do because the clinical values are much higher. So we really can do the detection of this protein in the clinical sample without, without any problem. Again, we need only 100 microliter. Just remember that is the, the good thing of our technology is the very low amount of sample, the real time, the level free and that we can get, and then uh, uh, again, we are still also waiting <laughs> for the clinical sample uh, to come to the lab, because uh, we always like to validate our result with clinical sample. I mean, even if you can um, make the spike of the, in the, I mean, in just in plasma, in blood, whatever, we always want to validate our result with clinical sample. Okay, so what we're doing is trying to make this uh, holistic approach uh, didn't explain alternative splicing. We have several papers on that if you want to read. I think it's not so easy to, to explain. So I was thinking that perhaps if you are interested, uh, I can explain a little more about that. But we have also several papers that we have done in collaboration um, with CRG. And so what we think is that uh, if we want to go for this early cancer diagnosis, we can combine the, the, cancer, the classical cancer biomarker, like protein biomarkers or DNA mutations, and then to, com to combine also with epigenetic biomarker. <coughs> so we have already demonstrated how we can do in a very easy way a DNA methylation profile, profiling. We can go also for the alternative splicing analysis. We can go also for the microRNA and beside the protein. So our idea <coughs> is to incorporate in a multiplex platform and then we can detect everything at the same time. And probably in less than 30 minutes, we will have the measure, I mean, the, the analysis done for each person for each patient. And we think this is important for the personalized medicine <coughs> because if we know the, we have the knowledge of the epigenetic and the genetic process that regulate the cellular fate, probably we can provide uh, uh, not only the early detection as the patient at risk, but also we can improve the preventive measure. We have a more accurate diagnosis, but also we can help in, uh, <coughs> in giving the, in, in the what is the best treatment for each, depending on the profile of this uh, person. And for that, we are starting <coughs> a new research line. Oh, there is one here, here sorry. <laughs> this is a new research line just starting. We don't have any, almost any result. So it was all this, starting by one of the senior people in my group that what we want is to contribute also to, the, in the case of the cell immunotherapies, in the case, especially in the T cell therapy, this is a therapy that is gaining um, a lot of attention and is going to the clinical practice. <coughs> but the main problem in this therapy is how you isolate the T cells and how you make the genetic engineering to express the receptor to, to join to the, I mean, to interact with the cancer cells <coughs> and to analyze the anti-tumor activity. And then you have to reinfuse to the patient. So this is a very expensive and time consuming procedure. And, and then the, <coughs> losing my voice. And it's not predictive evaluation. So what we're developing is this, um, we want to develop this biomimetic level free biosensor, able to have the detect and capture the T cells <coughs> with a affinity for the tumor antigens and then to analyze the activity, especially the cytokine secretion in real time. So we have the biosensor, we can allocate it at the level of single light cell, single cell, and then we see the cytokine expression <coughs> that we can monitor uh, the activity of these T cells. 
Ok, I got to see this. <coughs> oh, sorry. Ok, so this is uh, the idea that we have in the future, how we can use our technology because we are able to produce the technology, to, com to produce the prototypes, and then also just to provide this point of care for any user. I think you can use for the two things. I mean, to make a very early cancer diagnosis through the monitoring of this cell regulation pathway. And one uh, we have detected, then we can go also to help with the cancer immunotherapy studies. We are targeting mainly lung cancer and ovarian cancer because these are the most uh, difficult cancer to be detected in a very early stage. <coughs> so, well, I hope that I convinced you that this is the technology for the future. And, and this point of care biosensor, that technology that uh, you can get a very fast, direct, level free with a very high sensitivity, a low sample volume. Uh, this nanophotonic biosensor using light, if you have seen the level of sensitivity that we can get with this technology is amazing. So this thing is one, going to be one of the most competitive technology. In our area, one of the main problems is the surface chemistry, biofunctionalization, how you allocate your bioreceptor in order to get the selectivity and the sensitivity that you require. And also we need to, to allocate with multiplexing capabilities. That multiplexing capabilities is mainly an engineering problem, how to solve because we are using with nano uh, sensors and we have to allocate the light and then to do the, the data processing. But we think that in the future we are going to have this point of care technology for many different applications. So with that, I would like to give the, the thanks the thanks to my group. Uh, we have a very multidisciplinary group, as you can imagine. So we have physics, uh, engineers, biotech, uh, chemists. I mean, well, sometimes even we have mathematics, mathematicians, uh, informatics, all working together in this um, in this fantastic uh, area because we really need many knowledge in order to get to make the technology but as well to do also all the um, biotechnology or all the biosensing uh, applications okay so thank you for your attention thank you very much laura just before providing time for the attendees so why it, it looks like very successful, of course, in the COVID-19 now, the biosensors, uh, in microbiology. Um, you have, an, uh, of course, in diabetes, uh, a molecule, no glucose, can be detected. In, in cancer, still did, did not make it, no? the biosensors did not make it. I, I guess people have been trying now a lot. So, so why, what is the main problem there, what do you see? Well, I think that in this technology, <coughs> even before the pandemic, um, you know, the, most of the diagnostic companies, they were always saying that they didn't uh, believe in the point of care technology because, uh, you know, they have the lab, I mean, the diagnostic laboratories and they want to stick to these laboratories and they were always saying that, no, no, the point of care is not working as, uh, as uh, um, in a very efficient way, way as you can, you cannot get the same result like, like in an analytical laboratory. Well, that not good because I mean we can demonstrate it with the glucose biosensor that was not the case. <clears throat> but in the case of the glucose biosensor, it took more than 20 years to go to the market. From the first idea, first demonstration in a lab to the market was took uh, more than 20 years. Just because you have this sensor, you have also the biological receptor. You have to maintain your biological receptor alive and functional in any in any place at any time. No? So after the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, all, all the diagnostic company now, they realize that we need this point of care. I mean, they think we need the, to decentralize the diagnosis. It doesn't mean that the point of care means that you, you are going to use at home. You can use something at home, but of course, you can use this very small machine, for example, in a pharmacy with your family doctor, even here in, the, in your lab. I mean, you have this point of care could be more efficient to do, to do all, the, all the testing of the sample. So that's, perhaps this is the main reason. I think has been one of the reasons has been this. The second is that the point of care technology has been developed mainly by scientists 
and you know the scientists, sometimes you are more focused on publishing, and also because it's a very technological work. And you know, many years ago, everybody was more focused on basic science. Uh, for example, in my case, I was always focused on technology because I really like it much more the technology. And people would say, oh, but you are not a scientist because you are doing technology. So I think this is also something related to that, that we have many of these fantastic technologies now in the labs and they are not going to make it never to the market. So this is another reason. <clears throat> and there is another reason that perhaps you have seen even in the TV or in a series that is about a company called Teranos. Have you seen about, uh, do you know this story about Teranos? Have you seen that, this uh, company? So this is Teranos, was a company that formed by a, <clears throat> by a, well, a person in 2003 that she promised to have this point of care testing device uh, using a tiny uh, drop of blood and then able to make more than 200 analyze <clears throat> in this, uh, in this uh, tiny uh, drop of blood. Uh, then he was able to start this company in the Silicon Valley. The company was valorated in more than nine billion billion dollars. Uh, you know, the company was growing. She was in the even in the Forbes list as one of the rich person in the world. And you know, everything was fake. She has no technology. She has nothing behind, nothing. So and now you know she is in trail. I mean, she's now in the corporate. She's going to be in jail for several years. Uh, just a look at this, it's a very famous series in, now in Disney Plus, so there is also a book, I recommended you to see that, because I always explain this, because uh, this person started uh, the company when she was in the first year of the university, she left the university, and I always say, okay, if you want to do a technological work, you need to have not only a university degree, but also a PhD degree, and then after that, perhaps you can start a company when you have the knowledge to do that. Uh, so this is another, because it was in my area, you know, the diagnostic company were always referring to this case. No, 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 everything is like Teranos, so you cannot go, it's not true that you can do an analysis in a drop of sample. Uh, so I think now the diagnostic company are more interested and perhaps now we can go faster in this area. <coughs> the Teranos is a very paradigmatic case, but I thought at the beginning that Teranos was more like a new sequencing technology, no? not a biosensor. It was a biosensor? Did it, did it, did it? Well, she was using chemioluminescent in an assay. It was a kind of microfluidics and, and biosensor, uh, but she wanted to miniaturize, and it was impossible because, I mean, this is, was like a basic science project. I mean, you cannot start a company without having anything behind. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? <coughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the current de development about um, metabolic uh, biomarkers, not only uh, for cancer, but also for uh, uh, metabolic disease. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, we have a, a very long experience. I don't know if I have some uh, slide here. So, uh, no, this, this is this one, I think. <laughs> no, I don't think, I don't know if I have here. Let's see if I have a list of the <coughs> capabilities of my group. Uh, ah, here, okay. So I was showing here mainly just a few samples on the clinical testing, um, also mainly set, um, also just focusing on cancer. Uh, but of course, we have developed many different uh, as a biosensor, for example, for all kinds of protein biomarker like gluten consumption, hormone level, um, allergy diagnosis. So. Uh, we have done also for all kinds of genomics, but also for very small organic molecule, toxic molecule, also for the environment, and also for pathogenic and bacteria and virus and so on. Uh, so we have the capability to do almost any kind of, um, of um, biomolecular interaction, providing that we have the bioreceptor, okay? And we know what we have to look for. I mean, in a biosensor, you need to have to know what is your analyte, and we need to know the concentrations and so on and with biofluid. And also you need to have your bioreceptor. If you have the two, we don't have any problem to develop any assay. Thank you. Thank you very much, amazing presentation. By the way, the, uh, for example, the cost, the cost of a microRNA 
by a sensor that you have developed? Ah, the cost, okay. okay. Well, you know, in my area, one of the main th point is that there has to be low cost, yeah, always. So we have to think always in low cost technology. Even if you think this is amazing technology, well, this is amazing technology, but the cost um, per test, depending on the application, but a cost could be less than, depending, five euros, 10 euros could be even less. Mm. You know, the technology that we use, this uh, the one is based on gold, the gold we produce all these chips in, uh, in our, in our um, facilities, but it's very cheap. And also the one to, with um, this, the other one, the, the other one that you have seen that is silicon photonics. This is a more complex technology, but it's fabricating in micro, in, in clean rooms, facilities, and it's the same technology that you are using in your computers, in your uh, smartphone, in everywhere. Uh, so if you fabricate thousands of these chips, I mean, the price just going down to even, uh, to a few cents of euros. So this is a very, very low cost technology. Uh, and also because the, the microfluidics is plastic, so it's also very low cost. And also the biological reagents, due to the size that we are working, we are working all with a very low concentrations, even of the biological uh, receptor. And also we know how to reuse. I didn't explain here, but in my, light, in my lab, we reuse everything. So we know how to reuse even the same bioreceptor 100 times. And one, everything that you cannot use anymore, we, have, we know how to clean the sensor surface and to reuse even the sensor chip for many times. So, <clears throat> but it's low cost. It's one of the, one of the mandatory uh, objectives in this area is always low cost. So what, what are we waiting? Why hospitals are not using this? Because well, good question. That's the reason we're, st we're starting a new company now. Um, and our company, for example, we have this concept that we have a close point of care. And then we are going to supply with different cartridge for different applications. Uh, probably we are going to focus much more in infections because infections is one of the growing concerns, especially bacterial infections and also antimicrobial susceptibility. So uh, we are probably the company is going to focus much more on that. Uh, but of course, um, of course, I mean that you want to do that. We can also collaborate with you if you are interested to use our technology. But let's hope that in the future we can deploy this uh, technology for many other applications. So we have this idea of we would like to have this like a Nespresso machine. So you have your Nespresso and I'm going to sell you to many different capsules. And then depending on the application and the this acid, and then you can take the, the capsule that you that you want. So thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, following up on Alberto's question and also on, on this Theranos story that we were talking about <laughs> earlier, um, I guess that the key here is clinical application. So I was wondering how difficult or how challenging is the process to get all these devices approved for, for clinical use? Um, so, well, very good question. Well, our technology is suitable for clinical applications. This is one of the main, but also for environmental applications. So we are using also for environmental application. In the case of the clinical, this is an in vitro diagnostic uh, um, device. So we have to pass the, same, the re European regulation for the in vitro diagnostics. It's the, the regulation that we have to pass. You remember that this so in vitro diagnostics. So it's nothing, it's not interacting with the human body directly. So this is, could be a bit more uh, easy in this case. But uh, I know that the, the, you know, they changed just this year the regulation for the in vitro diagnostics. And now it's uh, a bit more uh, difficult, but it's something that has to be done by the company, not, not by us as a okay. research group. And then my second question is more focused on these wearables, you know, the breakthrough experience during the last years by these devices. Mm -hmm. I don't know how do you see this. Um, are you planning on trying to integrate all these biosensors in, in, in these wearables or, or, or how do you see this? Well, this is a good question. I mean, this is one of the challenges for the future, how to use this wearable biosensor. But remember, for example, the only one that is now in the market is this one from the glucose. And it's standing there only for 14 days because it's wearable, but it's always interacting. They need body fluids. So they have to have these micro needles and to go inside and then they're making these inquiries and then that's the reason why they cannot stand more than 14 days. It's not for the biosensor itself, it's with the interaction with the body. Uh, so in our case, we are not thinking to go to wearables at this moment. This is, I mean, this is a really more a challenging um, technology. 
Um, so at, at least, in, I mean, there is any of the new, I mean, the senior people in my group that are younger than me, that they want to start this wearable, I will be happy. <laughs> so, but this is one of the future. But remember, wearable means also interacting with body fluids because it's very, very difficult that we get. Um, I mean, the, the, probably the dream is how to make an analysis without uh, interacting with the human body. But this is very difficult at this stage. Okay, thank you. Great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, just a question. Um, regarding the, the cancer part, have you tried your biosensors at early stages? Because, for example, in the, in the case of lung cancer, that you show data for stage 3 and HA4, one of the main issues is the amount of circular tumor DNA that you have mm -hmm. at early stages. So it is true that it's easier to detect the molecule, the DNA or the microRNAs at the late stages of cancer. But the main advantage of this kind of uh, technologies is the early detection. Mm -hmm. So for clinical validation, have you tried the samples at early stages? Well, that's the main problem, how to get this sample. So this is something that we really would love to do that. In fact, with the 40 samples that we were analyzing for the microRNA for the lung cancer, we were trying to do also if they have some prediction of the stage of the cancer, but it, we didn't get any, any um, any uh, confirmative result. But the main problem for us is how to get to this clinical sample. We would love to do that. Because, for example, also with the colorectal cancer, with these autoantibodies, uh, we would like to have, I mean, the sample when someone is starting the, the cancer and then we are able to detect these autoantibodies. So, for us, we can do that. But the problem is how to get the clinical sample. That's the, the answer. We would will, we will love, uh, we will love to, that, to do that. We have been discussing with the clinicians many times how to get the sample, but it's not, uh, we didn't get any, any clear answer how to do that. So I would love, uh, we would really would lo would love to do that. Thank you. Um, of course, Theranos was a big problem, but since then, uh, I have read many articles in the newspaper that uh, several big uh, electronic companies have already you know, produced you know, several you know, uh, biosensor kit or to mm -hmm. detect you know, 20 different you know, cancers. For example, Shimazu, Hitachi, they are big electronic companies. And then, uh, in order for the you know, academy or you know, laboratory or startup company, in order to beat or in order to supersede those big companies, uh, the point is not uh, you know, equipment or device, but rather than which markers uh, they are going to use for the detection specific to uh, specific cancers. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, uh, if I understood well your question, I mean, you, you say that there are many, I mean, there are many new companies and many companies, also big companies trying to develop these point of care devices uh, for many applications, especially in the, in the case of the cancer. And I don't know if you understood well your question is uh, who is going to use this uh, technology uh, and why? No, uh, my, I think, you know, uh, not at the early stage of development, Many big companies already you know, made a you know, prototype and uh, they are in the production of biosensor uh, to detect you know, specific cancers. And then, you know, it seems to me what is important is not uh, of the device, but of the markers. Mm -hmm. What kinds of markers? Are you, going to, you, know, you mentioned about microRNAs, of course, you know, they also do the same, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, but, you know, which number or, you know, which uh, mm -hmm. mutation markers, that seems to be more important than the device itself. Well, of course, I mean, uh, at the end, the device is going to be like a black box, and then what you want is to, to apply for a specific application and to get uh, a very good result. Uh, so, um, we are always driving, um, well, but the, the, the difference with the technology, 
and the device is the level of sensitivity that you can achieve. For example, some of these devices that you speak is more based on electrochemical testing or other testing, and then the, they are much, I mean, the sensitivity level is, um, is not as good as the one with using optical detection. So this is the main difference between the technology, the level of sensitivity that you can get. But of course, I mean, I agree with you that what you want to have at the end is a black box where you can, but where you put your sample and then you make this detection. And the, in which specific area of cancer, in which cancer, I mean, which biomarker, this is driving mainly for the clinical knowledge. So what we try to do is to demonstrate that our technology is suitable for this analysis. But of course, we are always try to hear uh, to the clinicians or the, to, the, to the clinical knowledge, which are the best biomarkers, which are the really the, the, the ones that are giving you this early detection or even progression or even therapy follow-up. Uh, and then we try to adapt the, the te our technology and our results to that. But of course, we always depend on the clinical knowledge, something that we cannot decide, okay, we go to this cancer to another or to this specific application. So we need to, to have the knowledge of the clinical area. Thank you. J just to close a comment that the wearables, so the new generation, as you know, they are getting all tattoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, there are some, it's, some... It's a wearable at one, at one level. Okay. No, no, there, there, so, are, there are many people working on where in ta in tattoo biosensor, tattoo biosensor. But again, you need to have contact yeah. with a body fluid. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't see it in the next generation having any problem of having a biosensor no, no, no. under no. the skin. I don't see the problem. No, no, them. no. Okay? <laughs> I think the next generation will have it. Will have it as something that will be easier than to, to study mm -hmm. everything there because will be, the, the mobile will be under the skin, so it's, mm -hmm. it's going to be all, all those mm -hmm. things. So hopefully there will be a bright future for that, <laughs> yeah, for <yes>. biosensors. <laughs> I think, I think for, so. Not for human mankind from, from biosensors, <laughs> yes. Okay, but uh, again, thank you very much for the Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.